So yeah, um, thanks so much for coming along, folks. Uh, basically, we're going to do a really quick look at eight different web frameworks. So we're going to start looking at some micro frameworks. We're going to look at some batteries included ones, and we're going to finish off with some async. So yeah, just a quick introduction to who I am. Um, if I could remember to turn my clicker on, that'd be good. Yeah, so I'm Aaron Bassett. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. It's very imaginative. It's literally just my name. Um, and I'm going to try and go for, because it's like eight web frameworks, we're doing, going to do a whole world. It kind of sounded a bit like, you know, around the world 80 days, but Jules Verne So I'm going to go for like a bit of a steampunk, Victorian kind of aesthetic for the whole thing. So I probably should be a bit better on this image. Give him some hat. Let's swap out those Ray-Bans. Got to have a bow tie if you're going Victorian, and like <laughs> that facial hair really needs an upgrade. So yeah, so this is me. I'm a, a developer advocate for people who don't know what that is. Um, I literally get paid to wear branded t-shirts and hand out leaflets. Um, I do that for a company called Nexmo. We're uh, one of the sponsors here today, so we have a, a booth um, actually on this floor, I think. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out yet, you should. We may still have some t-shirts left, hopefully. Go grab some swag, talk to us about what we do. Um, but essentially, we're just a, an API company. We do uh, telecommunications APIs. So we make it really easy to add the ability to, to kind of inbound an SMS or voice calls and things to your own applications. So I work with this team. Um, we're kind of a bit different than most developer relations teams in that we don't come under sales and marketing. We actually come under product. We're all developers. We write all our own code. So all the client libraries and things that any of the developers interact with, they were all been written by the developer relations team. You know, we, we still program an awful lot, to be honest. And as well as programming, we, we write a lot as well. You know, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to integrate our APIs. So we write a bunch of tutorials. So this one um, uses JavaScript and the Ionic framework. This one's uh, Microsoft Bot, Android and Firebase, Flask and Google Cloud, the DAP peer-to-peer -peer protocol and Hug, Express um, deployed on the Glitch, Sanic, Django, Android, Swift, Angular Express. We go through a lot of different um, technologies at Nexmo. Because, well, as I said, we, we are an API company. We want to like show people how they can integrate our products into whatever stack they're using. But also, it's kind of fun. You know, we enjoy trying out new technologies. We enjoy trying out new frameworks. Um, I personally come from a background of, of Python um, and Django. I used Django for a very long time. Uh, so a lot of the stuff when I first arrived there was written in Django. Now I've started to branch out, look at other kind of Python frameworks, look at lots of JavaScript frameworks. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is the fact that like over my last year doing developer relations, I've obviously worked with an awful lot of different frameworks, uh, writing these blog posts and producing this content. And I'm going to look at some of those that I've used um, as we go through this. So what I'm going to build is essentially this. So um, in order to power a lot of our APIs, we use JSON. Um, we call it a Nexmo conversation control object, but it's, it's a JSON file. It's essentially just a list um, of actions. So this one is telling a telephone call to use a synthesized voice to read out some text. You know, pretty straightforward. And that's what I'm going to build for each of these different frameworks today. Um, so it's going to be one root that's just going to spit out some JSON. You know, so really kind of easy. So the first one we're going to look at is Flask. So Flask actually started off as a, an April Fool's joke. The author of Flask um, was quite well known at the time for being credibly critical of different frameworks. So as Naples Phil joke, he decided to write his own framework, a framework that did everything he hated about micro frameworks. And he released it. And he didn't tell anybody it was a joke. He just released it on the GitHub. He did a screencast. He actually got like a friend of his to record the voice and stuff for it. Um, he wrote a couple of posts and things. and. You know, even I think even the source code was actually obfuscated when he first released it before um, people started asking for the source. And it's now incredibly popular, probably one of the most popular micro frameworks. And this is something the guy built with everything that he hated. So I think the April Fool's joke's really kind of on him. <laughs> but getting up and running is, is, is very straightforward. Um, it's a single file kind of micro framework. You know, so you just create a Python file. Um, we can see here that I'm just importing kind of Flask. I'm starting a new Flask app. And then my um, root declaration is just a decorator on a function. And that function, using the JSONify uh, Flask method, will set the um, headers correctly to say that it is a, like it's actually JSON that we're returning. It'll properly encode it, and um, it'll then serve that up. 
And running it again is incredibly easy. You know, I've, I've got it here telling it what the name of my file is and it's just flask run. And we have that served up and ready to go. So that's the first one, kind of a taster of what we're gonna be looking at today. Um, I'll put the URLs up for, for each of the different frameworks as we go through them. Don't worry too much about trying to like write them down or anything. I'll be publishing all the slides on my Twitter anyway. So next one is Cherry. Cherry's a little bit older than Flask. It's been around for a little bit more, um, but it's very, very similar. Uh, it uses class-based views rather than function-based views. So here we can see I'm defining a class, um, just a regular kind of object, and I have, again, a couple of decorators on the methods, um, and I'm just returning again, another Python object, which is going to be correctly encoded in the JSON and served up um, on that route. So in this one, rather than defining the actual route on the method like I was before, um, we're defining this, uh, sorry, in our uh, cherry pie quick start. We have our different routes and we're telling what handlers to use for those. There's no special way of running this. You know, you run it with Guniecorn or your point your Python file at it. There's no cherry pie run, et cetera, like we had for Flask, but it um, is very, very similar again. So, again, URL for it. Falcon's kind of a bit new. Um, it's really kind of geared more towards creating APIs, so it's um, you know really kind of easy to to return JSON on it. That's what it's kind of expecting you're going to want to be doing anyway. We can see here it's very similar to what we have with Cherry Pie. We're declaring a class. We have an on get. Um, and then we're just returning this, this object. Um, we don't even need to tell it that it's gonna be uh, JSON encoded or anything, it expects that because it's, it's built for APIs. Now, this is kind of where, well, I'll put look up for Falcon first. So Falcon, you can kind of see some of this stuff. It's, it's nice, but um, it's a little bit convoluted. So the people behind the next one, Hug, kind of agreed in that as well. And they tried to simplify it a little bit. Now we can see with Hug, it's very similar to what we had with kind of Flask or what we had with Cherry Pie. You know, it's just a function that's returning a Python object that's going to get encoded into JSON. We have a decorator that's telling it what the root is. You know, it's very compact. It's very easy to run. You're not saving an awful lot of space compared to what you were or an awful lot of code compared to what Falcon provided. But that's only for the very simple example of Hug. Where it kind of gets more interesting is when we start looking at more complex examples. So in this example, you can see I've actually got two functions that are the same name. And each function is actually operating on the same URL. So they're both on this NCCO um, route. You know, they're both um, called, called NCCO, weirdly enough. But whenever we actually try to call any of these URLs, you can see it's got a versions in it. So the first one has got this versions equal one, and the next one's got this versions of a range of two to five. So whenever we call a URL now, we can just add the, the V1 or V2, V3 in the URL, and it automatically does the versioning for us. It also allows us to provide things like examples. So in the second example there, the, um, we can see I've got this F string that's going to substitute the who into our hello world that's returning. Um, and we're showing in, the, in our decorator that you know, this um, who, or we're, sorry, we're providing an example of what who should be. So we've got like who's going to equal world. Um, and we're also saying in our, in our method there that we have this who parameter that's coming through and we can actually type it as well. So we're saying that it's going to be a string. It's going to be a hug type of text. Now, if I try to access a URL that doesn't exist or I, I, or I try to provide the wrong information to Hug, we get this lovely kind of error output in the browser. You know, so it's showing us what routes are available, it's showing us what those routes are going to return, it's showing us what the examples were that we provided. You know, it gives a lot of kind of really useful information for whenever we're trying to explore that, that API. And this is all kind of provided out of the box from Hug. So it really builds upon what Falcon gives you, um, but then ext extends it with a lot of kind of useful things that you end up building time and time again yourself in Falcon anyway. So that's Hug. So that's our first kind of just look at micro frameworks. There's not an awful lot to them. That's kind of the point of them. As you can see in the code, it's, you know, we're talking four or five lines each and you're up and you're running. Um, they're really, really handy in that uh, with the micro frameworks, a lot of the stuff that we do is obviously building demos and we want to get stuff up and running really fast. You know, we want just to be able to People don't want to be wondering too long about the infrastructure or the code or the things that aren't next to APIs, essentially. We just want something that we can show them a couple lines of code, have it running in the browser immediately, and they can, they can get to work. And that's where, where these really come in. And we can see the majority of them, they're, they're looking really kind of similar in, in um, the amount of code that's required. They're looking very similar in how they, in which they handle kind of either class-based views or, or function decorators. So, 
we've done our uh, our quick look at the micro frameworks. I know there are not an awful lot of code to do them. That's that's kind of the point of them. So we're going to move on into so these batteries included framework. And the, the term or the term batteries included really was kind of coined by by Django. It was the first kind of batteries included. You know, everything's in there. With the micro frameworks, they just give you the littlest amount possible. You know, they're going to maybe give you routing, they might give you template handling, and they're going to give you kind of uh, uh, views, and that's it. You know, everything beyond that point is up to you. But with your batteries included frameworks, they're going to specify an awful lot more, and they're going to provide an awful lot more. And uh, for many of them, it's going to be kind of, you know, a, a convention over configuration. You know, so it's they'll have a way in which you, they prefer you to do things. And if you stick to that, then it normally works out pretty well. So with Django, um, we have a few different commands. Once it's kind of installed, you've done your, your pip install, your pip end install, et cetera, you've got this Django admin. And Django admin has a start project, which essentially is just going to build out your, your initial kind of template. Now, for anybody who used Django, um, probably 0.9-ish to 1.4, maybe, um, whenever you did your original kind of start project and then you would do your run server, it wasn't the greatest experience. It didn't set up your static files for you. Things were a little bit difficult, shall we say. Um, not anymore. With Django now, as soon as you run your, do your start project and do your run server, you immediately get this lovely kind of web page um, already up and uh, running for you. It also has a start app. So here I'm creating a new conversation app. Um, and it's going to create a bit of a file structure for you. So I've got just a print tree of that there. We can see that um, you know it's going to create a new folder, and that folder is going to be things around for your migrations, for your for your database, for your models, for your views. It really creates a, an entire kind of structure, and that's normally in the structure most people continue to follow with Django is, is the one that it kind of suggests. So once we have our our app created, we need to add it to our our settings. This is where you can kind of see you know, these these frameworks. Although they provide a lot more, they, they need a lot more configuration as well. Whereas the micro frameworks is like a single page that you just wrote some code in, ran your Python, you were done. With these, there's going to be multiple different files you need to change, lots of different uh, bits need to be updated. It's why we, we tend to avoid using these a lot in demos because you end up having to explain an awful lot of boilerplate to people. Um, but if you were using it for your own kind of major projects, it's probably what I would go for rather than micro. So anyway, here we're, installed, we're adding it to our installed apps. We then have our URLs. So you can put the URLs directly in the, the uh, URLs file. Um, what most people tend to do is have a URLs file local to each um, app, and then um, just reference that from your main URLs file. So here I'm, I'm looking at, I'm including these conversation.urls. And then we create our view. Now, Django does support uh, function-based views. So with, um, you can just have a, a uh, View that's going to return, take a request and return a response. The preferred method, method now is to use class-based views. They've been around for a while. They're still not, by some people, fully understood or fully utilized. Um, I personally prefer them to make it a lot easier to test stuff. Trying to isolate things in one large function-based view for testing is problematic. Um, if class-based views obviously makes the testing a lot easier. Um, if people are having problems trying to get their heads wrapped around how class-based views actually work, um, there's a fantastic reference called ccbv.co.uk. Um, it lists all the different views that are in there. Um, it allows you to drill down into them, you know, see exactly where they inherit from, what the methods are available on them, what the code of those methods are, should you need to extend it yourself. It's incredibly useful. Um, I probably spend more time on that site when I'm writing Django than on the actual Django documentation itself. Um, I don't know if that says something about Django's documentation around class-based views or not. Um, but it's still a wonderful reference, and I, I highly recommend it. The other thing that we have here is, I don't know if people spot it, is whenever I'm turning this JSON response, so I'm overriding the regular kind of response that we have um, coming back of this get handler, and instead I'm returning JSON. And I do have this see if equals false. That's always a major red flag. Whenever you're having to do see if equals false on any method, probably not something you want to be doing lightly, maybe you want to be considering first. And the reason for that is, is I'm actually returning a, a array as part of my JSON. Um, now, there is a uh, vulnerability around returning um, a JSON file that has an array at the root. So if you, re if you return a JSON file where essentially it's a dictionary at the root, you know, so it's an object rather, well, or both objects, but where it's a dictionary rather than an array, 
um, and you include that in a script tag um, from a, on your own website. So um, kind of cross-domain cross exploits. That won't render. You know, it's not going to execute anything. You can't just include a, a JavaScript object on the page using an external tag. It's not going to actually um, run anything. However, if you have an array at the top level, well, the, you can then um, overwrite the array function in JavaScript and have that read out the contents of it. So essentially, the, the array becomes like your JSONP, your function wrapper around, around that code. So there's a great art article that goes into this in a lot more detail about why it's a really bad idea. It's also why things like um, Django, by default, um, if you try to, to return a JSON response that has an array as the root element, it's not going to let you do it. You're going to have to actually specify that, hey, I know what I'm doing. I'm a, I'm a big person. Um, I'm a professional. Um, please let me shoot myself in the foot. It's OK. Uh, but you're still going to have to let to, to actually kind of go, this is my responsibility, and I will, I'll, I'll handle the, any repercussions from it. OK, so once we get our view, then we're going to reference that in our, in our URL. So this is the actual URLs for the, the app itself. We can see we've got this app name equals conversation, and we're naming the, the, the actual URL. This is just, it's a, a nicety. Um, it allows you then, if you're, if you're referencing that URL throughout your code, rather than having to, to like reference the URL itself or the root, you can just do conversation colon NCCO. And so if you change the root or your URLs change at any point, you don't need to go through all your code and, and reach and change all your hard-coded uh, paths. So putting it all together, you know, we've got our modifications to our settings file, we've got our two different URLs files that need to be updated, and then we've got our view itself, which is actually doing it all the hard um, kind of work, all the heavy lifting. So there's a bit more to it. The actual, the, once you get down to it, the views are very similar to what we've seen before. It's just we now need to, to kind of place them in the, the structure provided from Django. So there's a lot more boilerplate to update. There's a lot more kind of uh, configuration settings to set. There's obviously going to be a lot more code as well. When you look at all the, the generated code from Django's start project, you know, it's going to create an awful lot of stuff, um, a lot of kind of things that it's going to require to run. But um, yeah, I'll give you the, the URL for it as well. Most, most people probably were familiar with Django anyway. Um, the other one that we've got then on our kind of, our bar is included is Pyramid. So Pyramid's got a long history. Um, I think actually the Plone people might be down there like sponsoring, so they'll probably need to give you a lot more of the background on it than I can. Um, but their slogan is start small <laughs> and finish big. You know, so, and, and you really can. So with Pyramid, it can act like a micro framework. You know, you can have it all in one page. Um, you can define your, your views in there using your decorators to tell you you want to render from JSON, configure your app, and you're done. You know, there's not an awful lot more code there than what we saw for the likes of um, Falcon, for example, or Cherry Pie. You know, it's, it's a single function per view that's just got a decorate on it. You know, it really can start that, that small if you want. But they've got this whole thing about finishing big. So if you need it just for doing really quick kind of micro framework stuff, you can do it that way. If you're starting off on a larger scale project, then they actually use cookie cutter for doing their templating. So rather than having like a built-in kind of admin like Django does, um, they're just using cookie cutter. There's a bunch of different cookie cutters out there depending upon the type of project you want to start. I'm just using their, their default permit uh, starter. So you can see I've done my cookie cutter here. I've gotten this pip and env uh, install um, of all the dependencies. One of the things that I find a little bit strange, I th um, probably just my, my own way of approaching these, is the fact that Pyramid actually packages everything as a Python package. So your project then becomes deployable as a Python package itself. You know, it's going to have its own setup.py in there, which is going to list its kind of requirements, et cetera. And whenever you're doing your development, you can see that I've in uh, pip env installed that with dash e to show that um, you know, I'm still actually in development on this. Uh, so I can still modify the, the code that's contained within there and have it executed. And then it comes with all the configuration is done in any files. You know, so you'll have a development, any, a production, any, um, for all, or one for all your different environments. And we have this p serve to allow you then to, to start serving the files up. And once, very similar to Django, once you've run this kind of p serve on your, your different configuration file, then it's going to, to stand up a, a server for you and, and present you with this lovely, web, very red web page in this instance. Now, once, if we're using it as a, in this finish big kind of way, so as a, a much larger kind of framework rather than using it in a, as a micro framework on a single page, then we're very similar to what we had with, um, 
with Django, and we've got a couple of different configuration files to edit. In this one, they actually put it all in your init.py. And so we have this uh, perma.config. Um, we're telling it where to lift its settings from. We're setting up our roots. Um, so we don't have a separate URLs.py or anything like that for it. It's all done within this configuration. And then we're telling it just in this instance, just to scan our, our views file and find any, any views that are in there. So we switched from using just a single kind of uh, function of a decorator in this one. In this instance now instead, we're actually switched to a class-based view. Um, again, it has the same kind of benefits as what I was outlining with Django. It makes it a lot easier to test. It makes it a lot easier to, to override um, different methods and to create mixins, etc. Um, and we can see here that I uh, have created a really simple kind of route that again is just returning uh, this Python object that's going to be automatically encoded for me in the JSON and returned with the, the correct uh, application type. So a URL for a pyramid there. And if we look at the two kind of side by side, um, we can see even with pyramids kind of finish big mentality, there's a, not a huge amount of difference between the two. So Python's or Django's is a little bit more um, scattered through different files. Some of that's not really necessarily required. That's just my personal preference. Um, things like having additional URLs.py um, is not actually needed. You could just put it all in your in your uh, first URLs. In fact, there's actually a project out there that will turn Django into a single file uh, framework, much the same as Flask or any of the other micro frameworks. It's disgusting. <laughs> <sighs> So the, pre the, the good thing about any of these kind of uh, large frameworks over the micro frameworks is that there is conventions in there. You know, there is ways you should follow to get things done. There's lots of books and things out there that explain uh, for Django, two scoops is probably the main one. You know, go through all the best practices. And hopefully, if you approach one Django project, you know, it should look very similar to any other Django project. You're going to be structured very much the same way. You're going to, your models are going to be using the same ORM in order to access a database. You know, your views are going to be structured in very similar ways. Um, OK, you might have some use functional based views rather than class based views. But again, it should all be in a logical kind of place, and you should be able to navigate the, the directory structure and find what you need very quickly. But micro frameworks, they're slightly different in that, well, they just give you the very, very basics and leave the rest up to yourself. And for developers, sometimes that, even for larger projects, that seems like a great idea. You know, we don't want to be constrained by other people's ways of doing things sometimes. You know, we've got this grand, grand plan of what we're going to build. You know, we we're going to pour our heart and soul into this project and it's going to be fantastic and we're not going to make any of the mistakes that Django made or any of the mistakes that Pyramid made. You know, our use case is unique to us. So we're going to start with the most basic framework we can and then we're going to like start adding in all the different things that we need that are written exactly for us and just the way that we need them. You know, we're not going to worry about the fact that, you know, obviously Django is a great framework. There's a lot of work we can put into it. But concessions have probably had to be made because, well, it, it's, it's not geared exactly to what we need. So instead, you, you start off with a micro framework, and then you might add in like SQL Alchemy, um, or you might start adding in like some of your own ORM stuff. Um, of course, these are all interesting problems, and that's what developers like to do, so that's why we do it. Why would we use somebody else's ORM you know, when it might not do it exactly the way we want? So we write our own, and we integrate that instead, and well, that's the interesting part. Documentation is not interesting, so it's not documentation. Nobody does documentation. So the next developer comes along, and they, Maybe they like what you did. Maybe they don't like what you did. You know, they might um, and like implement it slightly differently, or they may not quite understand the way which you implemented it. There's no documentation, so they might use it slightly differently to what you'd used it. They might not even see what you'd done previously, and they might start a completely new way of accessing the database. And then a third developer comes along, and they actually they don't want to rule their own, so they just go and like Google it and take the first Stack Overflow answer and start doing it that way instead. You know, and suddenly this lovely framework that you'd uh, designed in your head starts to look a little bit different. You know, I've, and I've seen this happen as well in, in um, countless different places where they go, we're, gonna, we're not, not going to use Django because you know, we don't like the way in which it handles uh, views. Or we're not going to use Pyramid because we don't like the way in which it's, it's packaged for deployment. Or we're not going to use, you know, list your favorite frameworks here. You know, we're going we're gonna to build it ourselves because we can do better. You know, probably not. OK, so we're running through this really quickly. But we're now on to our async. So we're going to start off with probably the granddaddy of all async ones, which is Tornado. Um, the benefits of async, most people think of immediately as kind of speed. Um, Tornado is actually slower than Django. 
considerably slower than Django. If you're talking about first response times to render a piece of JSON to the to the browser, it's considerably slower, like by I think a factor of two. But where it really excels is in concurrency um, and also in accuracy. So whereas with Django, as your number of concurrent users in, uh, increases, your error rate also increases. With Tornado, it tends to stay pretty consistent and pretty low as well. You know, so it's going to uh, be able to handle requests might be slightly slower, but it's going to handle a lot more concurrent requests with a lot lower uh, failure rate. So let's look at how Tornado is kind of set up then. Um, again, it's going to be pretty straightforward. It's much the same as a lot of the micro frameworks. You can use kind of class-based views. You can structure it um, a lot differently. It doesn't really put a lot of kind of conventions around you. Here we can see I'm just defining a, a class with a get method. Um, I'm configuring my, my roots again, and then I'm starting my application. Now this um, will work, but if we look at this action here, we can see it's not actually going to work for Nextmo. Nextmo requires that to be a list. Even though there's one, only one action occurring in there, it has to be a list. Now if I try turning that into a list and running it in Tornado, we're going to get this. You know, it's going to throw an exception because of that, that security vulnerability that we talked about earlier. Um, it's a really nice exception, actually, and it explains why it's going to do it. Um, but it's trying to stop me from introducing a security vulnerability in my code. You know, but as we talked about earlier, like, I will find a way to shoot myself in the foot. Like, Tornado doesn't have a, a way for me just to go, you know, safe equals false and allow me to do it. It just blocks it. You know, it's, <laughs> um, it's saying that this is a security vulnerability. You should not be doing this. We're not going to let you do it. But it's, it's a Python class. You know, it's got all this lovely, we can go in, we can look at the, the actual um, the code for it. We can see it's got all this error checking in there. You know, it's looking to ensure that, um, that it's either bytes, a Unicode type, or a dictionary. You know, it's making sure that it's not going to be um, an array. If it is an array, it's going to return that, that exception. Um, but we're professionals. <laughs> you know, error checking is for people who do not have confidence in their code. So, so we're going to get rid of all of that. You know, and, and because it's a class-based view, um, we can just strip all that stuff out. We can overwrite their, uh, their write method. We can remove all that, uh, all that um, error checking. You know, let's, we will be wholly and solely responsible for uh, introducing all the security vulnerabilities we want in our code, damn it. It's our code. And if we want to be insecure, we will be. Um, so we, we remove all their error checking. Um, it now doesn't even check to see what kind of thing we're passing it. It's just going to be, everything's going to be JSON from now on. That's, that's, that's fine. We're just going to always return JSON. Um, and we, we uh, run this now and it's going to work. Um, so it's returning them. Now the, the last kind of one that we're, we're going to look at, and I know we've gone through seven already. I really wish I'd brought some of that water up on the desk. Um, yes, yeah, so the last one we're going to look at is, oh, you're amazing, is Sonic. So whenever I first came across Sonic, I actually completely and utterly dismissed it. Thank you so much. Um, I thought it was a joke, to be honest. I, I, it came up in like Hacker News. I went to their GitHub page, and this is their mascot. <laughs> Very enterprise friendly. You know, for, for people who don't wear it, it's just a really bad drawing of Sonic, um, hence Sonic. But yeah, it, it actually completely turned me off from the project. You know, um, even when you start off the terminal, like you get this in the terminal. Like they, they've, they've really gone all in on this mascot. <laughs> and it, it, I, I immediately assumed it was a joke. I thought, okay, so somebody's done basically a flask, but for async. Um, and I, I completely dismissed it. Like I didn't really look into it anymore. I didn't go back to it for probably like 18 months until um, at another conference, somebody was raving about this, this uh, framework. I'd completely forgotten all about it. And um, whenever I went to look it up, I was like, seriously? <laughs> this is still a thing? That's a long running joke. Um, but no, it's actually great. And I, I don't know if this is, is, I don't know the moral here is like, either don't judge a book by its cover or maybe branding matters, I'm, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I know, I know people sometimes have a go at, at the whole Django like Pegasus unicorn type thing and how it's not, you know, it's not enterprise friendly. It's not very professional. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. So Sonic came about basically because of UV loop. Um, so in, in Python uh, from 3.4, I think we've had kind of async. Um, 
there's now a drop in replacement for kind of the built-in async and Python called UV loop. It's uh, a lot faster. Um, and Sonic really just came as a, a way to, to take full advantage of that. Um, much like we had before, it's really simple to get up and running. You know, we're, we're just defining a, a uh, function. Um, we're going to add our decorator on that to say what the root should be. So it's always going to be this NCCO for any of our, our calls here. And then we just we can just run it from the command line with our our, uh, our Python um, hello.py, I think we call these. And we're going to get this similar, this output. Thankfully, this, well, I should say, this only appears if you've got debug set to true. Um, we don't get the lovely mascot if in your production when we're running it, so it's not quite so bad. Um, but it can also support class-based views. So we can see here that um, it looks very similar to some of the ones we've had. You know, defining our class, we have this, uh, and in this case, so we're using async. So we've got this async uh, method that's going to return our, our JSON for us, and then we can just run that as we did before. So we've got our Sonic one. Now, as I was going through uh, writing the code for all eight of these different ones, um, by the way, that's that's. That was a fantastic idea of mine. Let's, 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 let's do a conference talk where I need to write the same code eight bloody times. Uh, <laughs> but as I was going through writing the code, I actually started to notice that it's really similar. So here is how we define our, our root in Flask. And here is it in Sanic. And here is it in Hug. You know, we've got very, very similar. You know, okay, so it's app.root, app.root, hug.get. You know, but it's, it's a very similar kind of structure. You know, and then I saw those other things, like in Pyramid. You know, so whenever we're defining our, our roots there, okay, it's not app.root, but it's again, it's you know, view config and in a root name. Or whenever we're looking at um, our class-based views, you know, we've just got these get methods. And then on Tornado, we've got a get method. And on Django, we've got a get method. And on Falcon, we've got an on get. You know, again, very similar. And then I started noticing things like, so on Falcon there, we've got this API add root as well, you know, which kind of looks like Tornado's. You know, for configuring it, which kind of looks like pyramids for configuring it. You know, for all, all these, like the actual similarities to many of them were, well, very similar. Um, so it's <laughs> it's kind of an odd one then of you know, what's how do you choose which framework to use or which one's the better one? And to be honest, um, I've got very little kind of differentiation between them. Django would be probably my favorite to go for for batteries included because I know it best. If I had started out my career writing Pyramid, I'd probably be up here like using Pyramid for most of my examples instead. Um, whenever I come to use a micro framework, again, I'll pr normally use Flask because that's the one I use first. You know, it's it's not because I, I couldn't uh, articulate the actual my reasoning for it, why I prefer Flask over Cherry Pie or why I would use Flask over um, Hug or, or over Falcon. Because it's it's not a case of oh it's this particular feature is a killer feature or that particular way that does it is the way that I really enjoy it's just it's the one I use first, you know and I, I probably should explore that myself a little bit more because I probably am missing out on on uh, better ways of doing things because I, you know like most people I stick with what's familiar and I, I stick with what I know, um, but when running all these it turns out that actually, you know the the examples or at least the basics of each one is so similar that that reskilling or or learning the different frameworks didn't take very long at all, but I guess that's kind of like the whole point of Python. You know, uh, there should be one and hopefully only one way of doing things, apart from if it's string concatenation, then we should have lots of different ways apparently. Okay, so I've been Aaron Bassett. This has been my talk on eight different web frameworks. Hopefully, you got a chance to to absorb a little bit of each one. I know there was an awful lot of code going through very, very quickly there. Um, I will post the, I have a GitHub repository that has um, everything I went through, all the code examples um, with like explanations of how to run each one. Um, so that's um, all up on my GitHub. Um, I'll tweet it out on Iron Bassett. Um, I'll also put it out on, I should probably go right the way back to the start. There was a lot of slides. And, just one or two here. There we go. There we go. Keep going. Keep... Oh, there we go. Right. And on Nextmo's um, account as well. So we have a Nextmo dev account. I'll put all, all the links to the slides, links to GitHub repositories. Also, the different blog posts that I went through earlier, you know, so ones of Angular, Swift, Android, Django, Sonic, 
you know, um, Express or peer-to-peer stuff, all that kind of blog posts are all up on, on nextmo.com too. Um, again, they're going to be using all the different frameworks I've talked about today. Um, this is actually one from Mark. So Mark is one of my colleagues. Uh, you may have seen him. He's the other dude in the kilt walking about um, who doesn't wear it quite so well. Um, <laughs> So he's going to be talking actually later on today, um, but about half two. So um, I recommend catching that as well if you can. Um, other than that, we're going to be on the booth for the for the rest of the conference. Please come say hello. If you've got any questions about like any of the frameworks and things that I went through, I will try my best to answer them. Um, but as I said, a lot for a lot of them, I'm I'm really just a beginner as well. I've just been using them because I thought they were interesting and trying to get some example code and stuff out there for people. Um, but yeah, so again, that's my my Twitter. Um, please uh, follow along. I'll, I'll tweet out all links and things. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Aaron. So we have time for a couple of questions. So anyone have a question? Okay, back there. I think I'll just bring the mic. Mark on the other. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Um, hey. That was quite a nice overview. Um, you mentioned at the, at the end that you probably would just go for Flask or just go for Django because you got experience there. Um, when you look at the frameworks from a more um, company or from a business decision, would you consider or have you looked into any, I don't know, security handling of those fra frameworks and how they compare to each other? Would that be a, t um, a thing where you would make the decision based on and not go for one. Yeah, so um, for me, really, the the reason that I probably would pick Django again, and this would probably, people will uh, be able to tell me that all the frameworks do this, I'm sure, but is their deprecation schedule. Um, the way in which they handle kind of releases um, and stability of the actual framework is, in my mind, uh, crucial for really any kind of company. And that feeds into the security stuff. Um, I've seen companies where they just fail to upgrade because there's too many breaking changes or um, the way in which the different frameworks have handled kind of um, deprecation of, of APIs, et cetera, has been so bad in the past that they're really scared to do any kind of upgrades. And that means that they end up not doing even security upgrades as well. Um, so for me, the fact that they have a stable release schedule, um, a published and deprecation schedule they stick to, um, and the handling of their actual releases, both security and, and feature, um, is probably why I would I'd stick for, with Django. Hi, Hi thank, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question is, is if you um, could um, recommend some um, API over another, uh, if you plan to have a, a JavaScript framework managing the front end and a more uh, the back end side handled by some uh, yeah. Django Python API. And the other question, yeah, sure. can you say again the website uh, that you are using for Django reference? Mm -hmm. then cut that. Yeah, sure. I'll, actually, I'll just put the, uh, let's get that slide back up. It's in here somewhere. Let's get, let's get my, oh, I turned my thing off. Hold on. Yeah, draw all this stuff back on my face. Man, you know what? Let's just exit out of this and let's just go directly to the slide. I kind of forgot just how many slides I actually had. <laughs> that one. Yeah? So um, for anybody who can't read it, it's uh, ccbv.co.uk. Um, and it's a reference for Django's class-based views. It's incredibly useful. So the first part of your question then is, is um, so if you're essentially using the back end just as an API, like so uh, driving either, I'm assuming like React or, or Vue or Angular. Um, the, all of the ones we're looking at there had the ability uh, built in to respond with JSON. For some of them like Flask, um, it required using like JSONify rather than like the regular response. Uh, ones like Falcon are, are really built to be uh, API kind of back ends. So you don't even need to specify that you're returning JSON. As soon as it detects that the, your, the object that you're returning from your view is a Python object rather than like one of their response objects um, or just plain text, it's going to um, assume that you want that encoded as JSON anyway. 
So most of the modern frameworks will be geared towards that, that kind of way of working. Um, Django obviously is slightly different in that um, in order to, to turn it into really a, a API kind of backend, you're gonna need to use something like Django REST framework, um, which is, is really mature. Um, we've used it successfully on, on several kind of large projects and things. So I would highly recommend that if you wanted to go kind of the, the Django route. Um, again, even with the async ones, they're going to be geared towards being API backends as well. You know, so things like Tornado, again, if you just provide it with a, a Python object, it's going to assume that you want a JSON response. So I wouldn't worry too much about you know, whether or not they're going to act as a, um, just as an, as an API gateway. Um, all of them are capable of doing that, and they all handle it really well. Again, it's, it's just looking for whichever one kind of suits your, your style or your requirements best. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you for the talk. It's it's really nice having someone spending time to, to write eight times the same thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you said, uh, there's a, a difference between uh, the big frameworks like uh, Pyramid and Django because they, they include batteries. And mm -hmm. in most, the, the code you put, there is not real life code. You usually yeah. need some kind of authentication, at least some kind of authentication. And usually, uh, the ability to connect to some data thingy, either a database yes. or something. Do you know when you did the research for your talk, um, do you know if A, there are standard plugins for all the micro frameworks to do that kind of thing? And B, do you know if somebody maybe did the same thing as you, but with all that included, like uh, how much code it would take for a flask with a database and um, mm -hmm. identification? So for um, for Flask, I know that they do. Uh, Flask has got a very mature kind of plugin, um, uh, kind of ecosystem around it. It's it's one of those ones as well, though, that for things like database database access, that there tends to be you know a preferred method of doing it. So if you're googling around, you're going to find for Flask, it's going to be Flask, it's going to be SQL Alchemy, and it's going to be Flask Alchemy. You know those those things combined is normally the way most people do their database access. Um, but because the whole idea of it is, is it just does the minimum amount required and allows you to configure the rest yourself. Um, I have come across situations where people have been using Flask and have been using SQL Alchemy, but then they've written their own ORM on top of it rather than using Flask Alchemy, et cetera. Um, for uh, Falcon and, uh, and Hug, which is based upon Falcon, I'm not overly sure. I know they're fairly new. I've not done a lot of research into what's available for them at the moment. Um, I do know for... Uh, most of the different frameworks I went through um, as well, they do have, like for Cherry Pie, essentially, especially, they have a very mature kind of uh, ecosystem around different extensions for it. So they will have a preferred method of doing it again. Um, for the second part of your question, is if, if I've seen any, any major comparisons between all of them, I haven't. Normally, what you'll find is comparisons between maybe one or two. You know, one will show you, like, okay, this is how you get database access in Flask, and this is how you do it in Cherry Pie, you know, or something will look at like, okay, so here is how you will do the preferred method in Falcon, but I've not seen somebody do it for like all of the micro frameworks. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thank you very much. So let's give it a